The following presentation was recorded at the Newbury Buddhist Monastery, Victoria, Australia. Please visit our website at nbm.org.au. And now I'd like to start the um, Dhamma talk. We'll um, the Dhamma talk for this week, and it's about three weeks ago. I talked about a subject that I think uh, is very important, actually, and um, it shapes how we live our lives and uh, the sort of experiences we actually have in life. And that Dhamma talk, that talk that I gave, I think three weeks ago, was only the body dies. Uh, is there life after death? And uh, I, I gave the talk, but I didn't have time to focus on what the Buddha, was, uh, what the Buddha uh, said about this. So this talk will focus more on uh, what the Buddha said. And I think this is a very important subject for us, actually. We don't realize how, how important these views are in our lives. And uh, the view that I'm particularly focusing on is uh, the view that everything ends at death. Everything ends at death. Of course, there's the other view, which the eternalist view, that everything, there is a permanent, uh, permanent soul, a permanent spirit, or Atman that, go, that goes on and um, can achieve unification with God or Atman. But, and this is a, a different view. But the one I'm focusing on is the view that everything ends at death. Because this is quite a common view, not so much amongst Buddhists, because <laughs> Buddhists have an idea of rebirth, but amongst non-Buddhists. So I hope this reaches some people and encourages them to think about it. So many people have this view that at death everything finishes, the body dies, the brain uh, dies, and with it the mind. And also they, they think that um, the consequences, the good, bad, indifferent consequences of their actions during their lives also um, d uh, die with them. They, they may be remembered by others, of course, that's a possibility. Uh, for good or, or for bad, but for oneself, you know, that's the end of it, that idea. And the Buddha called this the annihilation view. And this is, it's interesting, isn't it, the, the idea that everything's annihilated at, at death, it all finishes at death. And in the Pali language, the, the language very close to the, what the Buddha used, he called that ucheda vada, ucheda vada, cutting. You know, and this was a common view at the time of the Buddha too, so it's not new. <laughs> but such a view will affect the way we live our lives and the way we experience our lives too. And I'd like to go into that a little bit before I talk about uh, what the, uh, the Buddha said about this view, the, the annihilation view, that everything ends at death. The other view, of course, is that the eternalist view, and last month Ajahn Brahmani spoke about that in the uh, Dhammaloka Center in Perth, so if people are interested, that's on the um, BSWA website, Buddha Society of Western Australia, which is a view that there's a soul or spirit in here um, that is eternal or permanent, and that it doesn't die with the body, but continues on and will eventually find unification with uh, God or with Atman, however they think of it. And the Buddha rejected this view too, as he did reject the other view of annihilationism. And he called this view Sasatavada. So it, it's really important. We often don't think of the impact of views, maybe you can call them beliefs, because sometimes people think, well, no, I don't have a view, but they do have beliefs. And these beliefs, um, play an important part in our lives. And there's often a belief, uh, you know, that there isn't an afterlife. And it's such a, it impacts on the way we live here and now. And also the um, mental states we experience actually. So they shape, as I say, shape our lives and they shape our minds too, these uh, views that we have. So. You know, I asked myself, if I believed uh, that everything ends at death, how would this affect me? And this is, I'm seeing it from my own point of view, but I think this possibly is very true of what other people experience in some shape or form. And 
if I believed that everything ended at death, I would think, well, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point of this life then? And also, it would seem very um, meaningless. It would seem there wouldn't be a lot of purpose or meaning in life if it was just this life. And uh, also, it would give rise, I would feel anyway, why bother? You know, it doesn't matter what I do, what I say, it doesn't really matter that much. Of course, some people want to be remembered uh, by uh, later generations, by posterity, as they say. And uh, so that, that is uh, one aspect of why people do what they do. But when we believe this, when we have this strong belief, it can lead to, a, uh, for me, it would lead to a sense of depression, I think. It would lead to a sense of de despair and potentially suicide because once one's depressed, once one's despairing, suicide seems like a, uh, an option that people do take up when their mental suffering becomes so strong. And it's very interesting because one of, one of the books that I found very, very interesting, Vic Viktor Frankl's book called Man's Search for Meaning. If you haven't read it, it's well worth a read. And it's a, he is a psychologist who uh, was a Jewish psychologist who spent the, he was, he was in the Holocaust, so he was in a uh, concentration camp. And he wrote about his experiences and developed a, a theory of, uh, from those experiences, based on those experiences. That meaning and purpose is really so important. And when we don't have it, when those people in the concentration camps didn't have it, they tended to die much quicker than they would have otherwise. And he said a very nice thing, and I think this is very relevant to, to our experience today, that suffering without meaning, suffering without meaning, equals despair. And I think that's so true, that when we, we experience difficulties, whether it be physical um, aches and pains, or terrible sicknesses, whether we experience the problems of aging, um, all these things, or whether it's mental, uh, went mental suffering because that's quite a strong component for, for people. When we experience those, if we can't understand, if there is no context for it, if there's no way to understand it, then the natural tendency will be to despair, to take it personally. Why me? And of course, this will uh, not help us at all. So Viktor Frankl, he started a, a school of psychology, I think they call it Logo therapy, logotherapy. So it's all about meaning. But really, too, uh, we look, if, if we believe that, you know, this is it, this life is it, then we will tend to try to find uh, as much happiness through experiencing the pleasures of what we see, hear, smell, taste and touch. Um, and this will become a big focus in our lives and can, you know, lead to addictions of various sorts, actually. And, if, and these days you see it, that people, it's, uh, the emphasis is to have as many varied experiences as possible, to collect these experiences in order to find this pleasure and happiness, uh, the happiness that comes through these pleasures. And of course that, you know, in, in one extreme it leads to that hedonist view that, yep, eat, drink, and be merry, <laughs> for tomorrow we die, I think is the, is the, is the, is the quotation, isn't it? And uh, it reminds me of, uh, I remember, it made a big impact on me when I read this, but I was uh, much younger actually, because it happened uh, in the 70s. There was a famous uh, um, Hollywood uh, m uh, movie star called George Sanders, and he was very suave and uh, um, played these sort of very suave roles and uh, so forth. And I, I think I'm, I read it at, that, uh, at the time he died in 1972. And he, he left a suicide note and he said, Dear world, I am leaving because I am bored. <laughs> I feel I have lived long enough. He was 62. I am leaving you with your worries in this sweet cesspool. Good luck. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? But that, that to me is like something that I, I think people, if they have a view that everything ends at death, could have. Because looking for your we look for our happiness and our pleasures from seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. And then we've done it all and we keep doing it. 
And then that sense of boredom can come, that sense of, wow, is that all there is? <laughs> this is another song. And what it will tend to do for us is to focus on the short term. But, uh, you know, some people may like this view because they think, well, at least I know what's going to happen, nothing. <laughs> Which I think is, um, you know, they'll be in for a surprise, actually. And other people may think, well, whatever I've done, especially the bad things, the deeds, you know, the things, the uh, bad things I've said, they will just, when I die, that's it. There won't be any consequences. They won't follow me. They won't haunt me uh, in, uh, um, in future lives because I won't have a future life, they think. And also, I know for people who are very, um, quite old, as we get older, you know, the body becomes more problematic. There's more difficulties. There's more sicknesses and more maintenance. I call it the high maintenance part of life. And many old people often don't want to uh, be reborn because they think, wow, you know, I, you know, all this sickness, all this, uh, you know, uh, this uh, physical pain and the mental pain that goes with it, it's, it's too much. And so they often develop this negative state of mind that goes along with that too because they find it so painful and uncomfortable. And I remember, I mentioned, sorry, Last, uh, when I gave this, gave the talk three weeks ago, I mentioned the story of a monk who, who mentioned to his mother who was uh, close to death that maybe, maybe you'll be reborn. And she said, no, thank you, dear. I've had enough. And I think that's probably not uncommon. People think that, uh, um, you know, it's been too difficult, too painful, and they want to finish with it, and they don't want any more of it after this. And the same, of course, is for, stands for people who commit suicide. They often feel like the pain, especially, it can be physical pain, of course, but it's often mental pain, and they can't bear it, and then they want to end their lives. And uh, again, the Buddha said this will lead, uh, actually, to being reborn. <laughs> and, of course, those mental states not resolved, not come to terms with. I like, uh, I read some time ago in a, uh, a book, uh, of, uh, which has a, a book about uh, death and the endings it's called, and there was a nice quotation in that book that I liked by Albert Camus, and probably some people will know him, famous uh, French existentialist philosopher. And he's talking about God, but I thought this is good for after, about if there's life after death, and that is... Uh, I would, I would rather live my life as if there is a God, or if, in my terms, there is life after death, and die to find out there isn't, than live as if there isn't uh, a life after death, and to die to find out there it is. <laughs> it's quite nice, isn't it? So it's a very... It, it changes the way we see the world. And so I think it's very important. It makes for a more positive uh, outlook. And also means that we take care of what we do in this life much more. And as I mentioned in the talk three weeks ago, we put more emphasis on, on the quality, the mind, which will go on to future lives, developing it and reducing the negative qualities in that mind and developing the positive qualities. We'll look after that which is our long-term investment rather than go for the short-term investment of what we can see, hear, smell, taste and touch. So, and uh, it reminds me too that when you think of it like this, a simile might be that uh, the difference uh, is that if you have a view that there is a life after death, it's a bit like recycling. We recycle, the mind is recycled rather than just thrown away, as it were, after, after one passes away, after the body dies, um, that it, uh, it finishes. If that idea is, uh, it's contrary to a lot of nature, actually, because you see that nature tends to continue in one form or other. It gets changed. So then we can look more at the long term if we, are, uh, if we focus on the mind and what we can do for the mind rather than focus on the body. And I liken this to the last time, to the container, the body, and the contents, the mind, our experience. 
And it makes a big difference if we focus on the content. We spend a lot of time on the containers, and we have to. We have to look after the body, for sure. But the contents is very important. And of course, one of the things with any belief is to, it makes it very difficult for us to um, look into it, to question. A belief is like that. You know, we, we believe it, but we d often don't question things that we believe. And it's true for Buddhists as well. <laughs> uh, so that this belief that there's nothing after death, it just finishes zero, is, a, is quite a widespread, I think, uh, view in non-Buddhists anyway. And because of that, many people just accept it. They think, yes, that's, that's the case. So it's good to differentiate, and I think this is important, between what we believe and what we know from uh, experience. Because if we do, then we realize, uh, hang on, this is just a belief. This is just a hypothesis as such. It's not tested. There is no experience that uh, confirms that this is true or it isn't true. So this is a, a very important aspect of how, why we need to investigate. And it's not only for those that don't, who believe that at uh, death everything finishes, it's not only for them, for Buddhists as well because then we look into it and we can, we can uh, from our own experience, from our own understanding, we can d develop uh, a more confidence perhaps in the Buddha's teaching and we can make it clearer for ourselves. That is important for Buddhists because if we have a, a belief, that's one thing, but if it becomes more of a certainty, if we, becomes more, we become more confident, we have more... Ex more uh, uh, conviction with it and uh, and also um, as it were information to back that up then it will make a difference when we come uh, we come close to death when we come to death to die and of course Buddhism as I often mention to people is all about and the Buddha is not about a belief uh, it's not enough to believe in Buddhism the path is about developing direct experience and that that is the aim of the Buddha's teaching. I always say, the Buddha's wisdom, it's his wisdom. <laughs> it's not ours. But we can certainly use it, and it's a very good place for us to focus on. And that's the point of the Buddha's teaching. And I like uh, what I came at. She had a very nice saying about, because um, often we say in, in English, we have this saying, faith can move mountains. But she had a lovely saying. She said, but if it's blind faith, being blind... It doesn't know where to move the mountains. <laughs> That's quite true, because it's just, it is that, it's blind faith. So Buddhism is always about balancing this faith or confidence, conviction, with wisdom. Has to be, has to be. But it's an energising factor, so that's very important. So as I mentioned in that last talk, you know, it's really good if we investigate these, uh, investigate uh, this view or this belief that uh, at death everything finishes. And uh, as I mentioned in that talk, there are a number of areas we can investigate in. And if you're interested in that, uh, so this is good, it shows you where you, can, <laughs> where you can start the work to investigate. You can look at that talk, it was about three weeks ago. So as I mentioned, the most common views about uh, what happens after death, of course, is, is, as I mentioned, nothing new because at the time of the Buddha they were very much the same views. And, but the Buddha gave a very, very nice, clear um, uh, teaching about this in a very famous sutra. It's also uh, it's a discourse of the Buddha, a teaching of the Buddha. It's not a long one. and It's, a, it's the Kachana Gota Sutta. And this is a, a really good one for uh, looking at a rebirth and looking at this idea that life uh, ends at death or the idea that we, we go on eternally, permanently, um, and because it goes into a lot of depth. And it's uh, a very, very deep teaching, so I can't cover all of that, but if you'd like to look at it, it's in the uh, uh, connected discourses, this is what we say in English, connected discourses, and it's number sutta, it's in the twelfth uh, section, uh, we call them Samyutta, and it's the fifteenth sutta, the Kachanagota sutta. 
And this is where he puts it very simply at the beginning, actually. This world, Kachana, for the most part, depends upon a duality, upon the notion of existence and the notion of non-existence. And it's largely, I think, speaking about notion of existence after death and the notion of existence, non-existence after death. So this is this view of eternalism and this view of that uh, annihilation, that everything finishes at death. And uh, it, I suspect it has a lot deeper meanings than that too, actually, it goes further. But as I say, it boils down to that idea that there's a soul or a spirit that uh, is eternal and will be unified with God and uh, or Atman. And uh, that the body doesn't, when the body uh, dies, this spirit goes on. That's one idea. That's eternalism. And the other view, as we've mentioned, is that when the body dies, there's more, this more materialist view, actually, these days. And it was at the time of the Buddha. There was this view, too. The body and mind are just products of matter. And when that matter dies, the body, <laughs> then everything else goes with it. So, and of course, there are a lot of variations on this. So it's a, it's, this is a bit of a, a, sim, a simplified view. But the Buddha, and in Buddhism, it's not that we don't have any views. Views are important, but the, the main difference between the uh, views that I'm talking about uh, is that these are views that um, lead to uh, enlightenment. And the Buddha called these views, and these are useful. They don't lead to negative mind states. They are in accordance with reality from the Buddha's experience. So we call these right view, as I mentioned. And always people say, oh, how can you say something's right view? <laughs> you know, uh, and everything else is wrong. No, it's not that. But it's the right view for taking us to enlightenment, taking us to awakening. If we have this view, it's possible that we will um, become awakened, we'll become enlightened. Uh, many of the other views, particularly the view that uh, everything ends at death, well, there's no potential, <laughs> there's no, unless you make it in one life, which is asking a lot. But it's important too to note that the Buddha, he said this, he taught this, not from as a theory, not as a philosophy. He taught it as direct experience, from his own enlightenment experience. He, he experienced this and he, he is letting us know this is a very... Uh, important area to uh, to keep in mind and to investigate, as I say. It's not just a matter of believing that. And of course this right view... Oh, look at that. It's not only about the, that we have uh, future lives, but it's about giving, it's about karma, it's about uh, parents are even mentioned in by the uh, the Buddha and rebirth, like we are talking about, and that there are awakened uh, beings, there are enlightened beings who, have from who know reality from direct experience. So the Buddha said that in that right view, there is this life and the other life. And of course, there are the results of karma. And I'd like to continue with that uh, sutta because he goes into a bit more detail about this uh, existence and non-existence. Sounds a bit theoretical, but it's existence in terms of is, is there an existence after life or um, is there non-existence after life? So that's what the Buddha is talking about. And as I say, this is quite a deep sutta, actually a deep teaching. This world, uh, Kachana, as I mentioned, for the most part depends upon a duality, upon the notion of existence and the notion of non-existence. We had that before. But one who sees the origin of the world as it really is, with correct wisdom, the origin of the world, with correct wisdom, there is no notion of non-existence in regard to the world. And it's important to notice that when the Buddha says the world, he's often referring to the world of this body and mind, our experience. That's the world he is talking about, because that is our world. That is the limitation of how we know the world. So he's, it, this one would be talking particularly about this, the body and the mind. So for one who sees the origin of the world, the fact that there is um, uh, rebirth, 
and sees it with correct wisdom, then they know, oh, no, there cannot be non-existence. It doesn't all finish at death. So having seen, yes, someone who sees with correct wisdom, this is clear insight, um, direct experience, um, they see, yes, there is rebirth. So yeah, the idea that there's non-existence after death, that we, everything finishes, not true. That's not the case. And then the, he continues, and for one who sees the cessation of the world as it really is with correct wisdom, there is no notion of existence in regard to the world. That sounds a bit difficult, doesn't it? <laughs> but what he's talking about here, one who sees cessation, cessation is this natural process of finishing, things finishing, not by willpower, not by force. And the cessation of the world is the cessation of each of us, our body and mind. When we see that it can cease totally, um, this is at enlightenment, it can cease totally. The mind, the body certainly at death, the body, nobody, nobody takes a body with them on to the next life, fortunately. But, <laughs> with, um, but we certainly take the mind on. But someone that has uh, become enlightened they, the mind can cease to, they can then experience Nibbāna and then they will not be reborn again. So somebody who sees that that is possible knows, no, it's not a permanent state. You know, this, this sense of self, this soul, the spirit that people often focus on, no, it's not permanent because an enlightened being, an awakened being, they can finish with the body and the mind. And this is uh, quite an interesting, different, different perspective, isn't it, from, from the uh, duality or the uh, dichotomy, duality of eternalism, it's going on forever, or the other side, which says it finishes all at death, you know. So, but uh, very typically, the, uh, the Buddha he has synthesized these two views and he's come up with what he calls the middle way, which I'll read what he says. And the middle way between those two extremes, you know, this self, this uh, soul, this spirit's going to go on forever, you know, different lives, but I'll, I'll eventually make it to uh, unity with God, you know, or Atman. Or the other view, that life just ceases totally once one dies, that's it, kaput. And then this is what the Buddha says, all exists, like after death, kachana, this is one extreme, all does not exist after death. This is the second extreme. Without veering towards either of these extremes, the Buddha, he says the Tathagata, teaches the Dhamma by the middle. And by the middle. So everybody thinks, well, what is, the, what is the middle way between those two extremes? And then he teaches what we call in Buddhism dependent origination. You know that our experience of life is not coming from a, a permanent self, a permanent soul or spirit, but is a, core, a chain of cause and effect that's going through our lives. And this is what propels us through life. All this conditioning that we, uh, we accumulate through, we'd say more than one life actually. <laughs> and this is how the Buddha, for those who don't know dependent origination, it may, it may sound a bit uh, difficult, but it gives you an idea of some of the links the causes that the Buddha could see. And he said, this is what's driving us through our lives. This is what is taking rebirth, all these causes and conditions that we create in this life and in previous lives. So he says, with delusion as cause, will comes to be. This is uh, the Sankharas, but this is, yes. And with will as cause, Consciousness comes to be. With consci consciousness as cause, name and form comes to be. And I'll just say that name and form is, uh, name and form is of course, uh, materiality and our mentality. So it's very much in personal terms like body and mind in a sense. And usually the mind aspect, because we have consciousness, you mentioned consciousness just before it, the uh, mental aspect is contact, feeling, and attention, and intention. Sounds a bit technical. So we have this consciousness, and the body, and these other mental factors that uh, create our experience. 
And he says, with this name and form, coming from body and mind, as the cause, the six sense bases come to be. And these, of course, you know, sounds a bit technical, <laughs> but this is uh, the five senses, we all know the five senses, and the sixth sense in Buddhism, the mind. And he says, with the six sense bases as cause, we have uh, sensory contact comes to be. So if we have senses, including the mind, we will have objects of those senses. We'll see things, we'll hear things, smell things, taste things, touch things, and also think about things or experience things mentally. So this is with sensory contact, how it comes into being on the basis of having those six senses to begin with. And then, then with sensory contact as cause, experience, this is Ajahn Brahm's translation actually, experience comes to be, and the more traditional uh, rendering of that is feeling, but usually uh, experience is quite a good translation, I think, because experience is either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, which is exactly what uh, uh, Vedana is. And so from those sensory contacts, then we'll have these experiences, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And with experience or feeling as a cause, wanting will come into being. So we tend to either want the pleasant, or we want to get rid of the unpleasant, or maybe we ignore the neutral, we don't pay much attention to it. And then with this wanting uh, as, as the cause, this is, uh, wanting is the translation for tanha, this is the villain of the peace in Buddhism. <laughs> this is what's driving us through life after life. With wanting as a cause, uh, the, uh, Ajahn Brahm translates, fuel becomes, comes to be. This is another translation for upadana, or clinging. Most Buddhists will recognize clinging. It's a very natural process. You know, if you, if you uh, have this wanting for something that's pleasant, and then if it's very pleasant, you want to continue it. You'll cling to it. You'll, you know, it will become a very important aspect of your life. And this is how, of course, this is a, the addictive nature of the senses, whether it be tea, coffee, cigarettes, uh, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is, sex, all these things. That's the way it will tend to go because something's pleasant, we want it, and then we keep clinging to it, we want to repeat it. And of course that repetition in and of itself will give rise to quite a bit of disappointment as often it doesn't measure up to the initial experience. So, so this is this wanting giving rise to, as a cause to the fuel upadana, clinging, as more commonly known as. And with fuel or clinging as the cause, states of existence come up. So this is, they cause these states of existence that we can be reborn into. And we know the, uh, the sense the sense, the sense realm, that's the, the realm we live in, but there are other realms of existences that we can be born into. And with these states of existence, they exist there and we can go there because of our karma, rebirth happens. And with rebirth as cause, aging and death, sorrow, crying, pain, unhappiness and distress come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. So this is talking about how, how the difficulties, the problems in our lives are generated through this process, particularly of the sense contact, of the feeling, and then the reaction to that feeling. But then the Buddha continues, he says, if that were, that were the whole picture, it would be very depressing. But the Buddha, of course, is pointing, all his teachings are pointing to the end of suffering. But to get to the end of suffering, we have to understand suffering first and where it's coming from, the origin, how it's come up in the first place. Once we understand that, then of course uh, it, we can allow it to cease. This is not a forcing, it's when the mind sees clearly what the problem is and then lets go of that uh, wanting or that craving, that um, tanha. And this is the second part, but with the remainderless fading away and cessation of delusion comes cessation of will. So this is this ignorance about the nature of life, of reality. 
and then with the cessation of will, this is the will that uh, does good and bad things. And also the Buddha calls it uh, imperturbable things as well. These are things that lead to very high states of rebirth um, in the formless realms. So with the cessation of will then becomes the cessation of consciousness. And with the cessation of consciousness, cessation of name and form, basically, as I said before, in personal terms, more like body and mind. And with the cessation of, uh, of name and form, then the cessation of the six sense bases, because there's nothing to be a, 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 for, a platform for the senses anymore. And with the cessation of the six sense uh, bases, cessation, there is the cessation of sensory contact. With the cessation of sensory contact, uh, cessate, there is the cessation of experience comes to be. This is feeling. Yep. And with the cessation of feeling or experience, cessation of wanting. If there's no feeling, if there's no pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, then there won't be that wanting to get, wanting to get rid of. And with the cessation of wanting, there is the cessation of fuel or clinging, and with the cessation of that clinging or fuel, there is the cessation of states of existence. And with the states of the cessation of states of existence, this is power. <laughs> I hope this is not too technical for you. There is the cessation of rebirth. And with the cessation of rebirth, once birth is finished, again, aging and death, sorrow, crying, pain, unhappiness and distress cease. Such is the cessation of the whole mass of suffering, this whole mass of suffering. So that's how the process can end for an enlightened being. You know, this is actually, um, and as I mentioned, the cessation is a natural process. It's not coming from willpower. It's not coming from force. It comes from letting go, actually. It comes from letting go, just due to the mind really understanding the nature of reality and no longer expecting from reality what it can't give. Because reality is always based on a change, a Nietzsche, and uh, we call it Buddhism, a Nietzsche. And change is the means, doesn't it? There, there cannot be a permanent happiness. Fortunately, not a permanent unhappiness too. <laughs> but also it means there can't be a permanent me. If change is the nature of the whole of the universe, which the Buddha is saying, it means that there isn't a permanent, it can't be a permanent self. We're all works in progress, that's what I call us, <laughs> going along. So, and then when the mind sees reality, when it has that letting go, then it is liberated from being reborn. Because no longer does the mind think, wow, I want to be reborn. We don't actually... Uh, the mind just is programmed to want to be reborn. And so it's really only this deep wisdom that understands there is no point in being reborn, actually. It's asking for more suffering. And uh, the end of the process, of course, is, and this is a nice description that they, they give, uh, the Buddha gives, since uh, when one does not generate or fashion uh, willed activities, this is creating karma, one does not cling to anything in the world. Isn't that nice? Uh, not clinging, uh, one is not agitated. Not being agitated, one personally attains Nibbana or Nirvana, sometimes they call it. And this is the point. He understands, or one understands, destroyed his birth. The spiritual life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. So that's how the... And some people may think, oh, isn't, isn't this annihilationism? But it isn't really, because the natural process coming from wisdom, from understanding, is not the annihilationist point of view that often they just want to finish with uh, life, not to have anything after this. And I remember Ajahn Brahm used to have a lovely... Uh, a story, I don't know if it's in his book, Opening the Door of the Heart, but there used to be one of these uh, uh, fashionable uh, desk 
toys, you know, things you put on the, <laughs> the desk that, that don't have really any purpose except to, you know, uh, entertain us probably. And this one was a, uh, a toy that had this hand that you pressed a button, this hand came out, it went around and it pressed the button off. <laughs> it turned itself off. That was the whole of this desk toy. <laughs> I don't know how, you know, once you've done it a few times, I don't know if you keep doing it, but maybe it be interesting for others. So that, that is very much, you know, like a good image for what we're doing, what happens when one has that wisdom and understanding. It's not something that is easy to do, because not only is it wisdom and understanding, as I'll point out, it's purity of mind. There can't be any negativity in the mind. If there is any negativity in the mind, whether it be greed, desire, or whether it be hatred, aversion, or ignorance, delusion, if any of that, we won't see reality clearly. We won't understand and we won't have the wisdom that can end with end, uh, being reborn. And one of the monks uh, told me the story of his auntie, who was very old, and they were talking about death, or she was talking about death, and saying, well, everything finishes you know, completely at, at, uh, at, the, at death. And the life, there's no life after this. And she was very, she was very firmly convinced of this. And, and this monk told me she's a, she's very realistic, <laughs> very uh, probably materialistic or down to earth, perhaps that's the, another way of saying. And he mentioned this. Well, he said, well, this is actually the aim of uh, the Buddha's teaching. But uh, uh, to finish with being reborn, it, it takes quite a bit of, of work, actually. Because, as I said, we have to purify the mind of these negative qualities. It's, we can't, uh, you know, when we, if people want to just finish with life and they don't want anything to be after, there's a really negative state of mind running there. But we have to, as I said before, to be free of de desire, aversion and delusion or ignorance. And to develop the wisdom that understands reality, that understands that all this wanting, all this craving uh, only lead to rebirth and when we let go of it rebirth can finish and that allows the mind to uh, cease naturally so, and, and to attain Nibbāna we would have called this the highest happiness many positive qualities about it, some people may think oh no, no thank you <laughs> but of course you know, if one's seen, you know, uh, re uh, the fact that we've been reborn so many times and, and the unsatisfactoriness that's inherent in a process that is all about change. It will never, never be perfect, can't be, <laughs> as much as we try. So the, uh, the process for this, uh, it's now about 10 o'clock, so I'll just I mention this because I think it's important, the process of... Um, that continues our lives is, is quite, a, quite a, a simple process really. It's driven by our wanting or desire to be reborn actually, to re-experience the things that we found very important in our lives. And I'll go into this actually. And because the Buddha said there are three desires that will take us to rebirth. And he was really there are lots of other desires, but these ones will bring rebirth, he said. And the first one, of course, is the desire to re-experience everything that we find uh, dear and delightful in this life that, through the five senses. And uh, this will be all our family, our friends, our loved ones, our partners. But during the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, I think we've seen a lot of what we hold as dear and delightful because we haven't been able, many people haven't been able to do it. And one of the one of the things that I uh, that uh, um, we people haven't been able to do is go to the footy. <laughs> I know somebody said to me, "This virus must be really serious. It stopped the footy," <laughs> and that's quite true, because people are really you know focused on this sport. And you see it in the news, you know, the rugby or the the football. You know, when's it going to start? And and, and this has been a big focus for people. But this is our attachment, isn't it, to these five senses. And it's a form of, we get, our, get some happiness from, us, from it, but it's not this satisfying inner happiness that we can develop in the spiritual path. And then the Buddha said the second type of desire we can have is that just the desire to exist, to be, 
And we see this in this life, you know, to be something, to make something of ourselves, to make an impact. And this, of course, drives us towards this survival instinct. instinct. And this is a really strong mechanism for rebirth, actually, because we see it. I've seen it. You know, if you're in a situation where you feel your life is threatened, you don't have to think your way out of it. That you immediately react. It's extraordinary how, you know, it just bypasses thought. Thought is too slow in some situations. You just do it. And it's quite amazing when that happens. But this is, uh, this is uh, uh, deep-rooted uh, desire to exist. We call it bhava tamha. Very strong. And then, of course, some people have the desire not to exist. We talk about, you know, people want to suicide. You know, these people who are getting old and they don't want to continue. They don't want to have another body which is going to get old and, and uh, uh, has problems. The interesting thing with that is the Buddha said, you know, when people commit suicide, they'll have a surprise <laughs> because they'll come back. You know, the mind will still be there. So the, the arahant, the first completely enlightened person or awakened person, has let go of these three desires. And the other, th the other aspect that drives rebirth is karma, the actions we've done of body, speech and mind. Mind is the important one, actually. This life and in previous lives. And that will determine where we're reborn. And in brief, or it's really the states of mind we develop will take us to rebirth in states that are very similar to that mind state. So if we develop very um, beautiful mind states, very, um, uh, very good uh, morality, we tend to have rebirths in very good situations, we say heavenly worlds. And conversely, if people develop a lot of aggressiveness, uh, aversion and these things, they'll be, they'll be born in states where their mind state fits in, which is not pleasant. And the third aspect of this process, so we had uh, this wanting or desire, three types, we had the karma and then we have consciousness. This is, what is consciousness? Consciousness is that capability of the mind to know what's happening, know, usually the six senses. And the Buddha had a lovely simile for that too. He said that uh, the existence is like this field and uh, consciousness is the seed it's planted in this field and desire, this uh, wanting, uh, uh, craving they sometimes call it, is like moisture and karma is the, the actual field, so the things we've done. And this is how existence, re-existence occurs, rebirth occurs. So I'd like to um, maybe finish uh, there. I'll, just, I'll do one quote from the... It's very nice. Ajahn Brahm likes this quote a lot. It's a nice, nice quote from the uh, Visuddhimagga, the path of purification. And it's actually quoting another source, but they don't, they don't mention uh, who it is. And it says, No God, no Brahma can be called the maker of this wheel of life. Empty phenomena roll on, dependent on conditions all. And of course, empty phenomena means just that there's no permanent self here. That's what it means. And dependent on conditions is really what I was talking about before, that all these things, uh, dependent origination, that give rise to our experience, give rise to us making karma, give rise to us making our unhappiness and happiness, you know, those, those are the things. And so I'd like to uh, just finish with, oh, there's quite a bit more that I could say. But <laughs> The important thing, actually, that I should just mention at the end, the Buddha's advice to us, given this scenario, you know, of rebirth, of, of life after life, he is really concerned for our happiness and well-being of, of uh, all beings, actually. And that's the main reason that the Buddha teaches. There's no other point. It's called compassion. And what he was teaching us is that we need to make good karma in this life. We call it merit in English or punya in Sinhala pin. And he advised us to develop all the positive or wholesome courses of action, particularly you know, like we took the precepts today, abstaining from the negative aspects, uh, negative actions of speech and action and mind and developing the positive. And the ones that we uh, mentioned in the precepts, if you understood them, are particularly important, not killing, not stealing, not committing sexual misconduct, not lying, 
not using divisive speech, not using harsh speech, and not gossiping, not having a strong mind of envy or jealousy. They sometimes call it covetousness, but this is a very odd word, strange old word. Not having a strong mind of aversion or hate and not having wrong view. So this is a very important uh, aspect of it as well. So he emphasized that uh, if we have good morality, if we've developed these ten courses of good action, we're not harming beings, we're actually um, looking out for their welfare and happiness as much as possible, developing good states of mind, then this will determine our, our next rebirth. We can determine our next rebirth. If we have good morality, we can determine our, determine our next rebirth. Or, this is important, that it be, could become a basis for becoming awakened, fully enlightened. So that's a really important aspect. Very practical, what we can do given our situation of being reborn. <laughs> so... There was a, I, saw, I saw a joke on the internet that said, I, I don't believe in rebirth. I did in the previous life. <laughs> I thought that was quite funny. I didn't see all the joke in between, but it was quite funny. I thought, yes. So I'd like to conclude by saying the Buddha uh, knew this from direct experience. He wasn't just making up a theory. But this is not our experience, so we need to look into it. And that's for Buddhists too, but particularly for those that are not Buddhists who believe that Death's it, finished, kaput, all over. Because that won't, won't lead to good results in this life, perhaps. Well, for sure. And certainly um, when they're reborn, we say they'll be reborn, it won't lead to good results in the future. And to develop those positive or wholesome uh, aspects in our lives of body, speech and mind that lead to happiness in this life. This is one of the teachings of the Buddha happiness here and now. He's not only talking about the future happiness, happiness in future lives. Happiness here and now. And if you do good, it will be, that will basically lead to happy results. If you don't, if you do bad, whether it be through speech, action or mind, then we will experience uh, the results of that, which is usually negative, unhappiness. And of course, he's talking about the ultimate happiness. So we've got the present life, the future life and the ultimate happiness finishing with it all. <laughs> but that takes a lot of wisdom and uh, is not an easy thing to do. So I say to people, don't worry, you won't suddenly or accidentally become enlightened because <laughs> sometimes I think people think, oh no, I don't want to. And many Buddhists don't want to. They want a good rebirth, a happy re a rebirth in say heaven or in a, in a good situation. And that's not, that's not a, bad, uh, a bad thing, but the Buddha called that uh, like a lesser intention, you know, uh, not a lesser intention because a higher intention is to finish with it, but not easy. So I'd like to end just by reminding people that the Sunday program will start at nine. If you tuned in and thought, hang on, he's already, he's already um, mentioning that, uh, uh, I'm, he's already talking when you, turned, uh, when you tuned in, um, it will be starting at nine. And if you miss some of this talk, please look at the uh, YouTube channel for the BSV. They will upload this talk um, in a day or two. So hopefully you can see the rest of the talk if you wish to. So I hope that hasn't been too theoretical, but also to emphasize how important it is in our lives because it changes, uh, shapes our lives and our experience of life. There are questions. There we are. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Ajahn, yeah. for the insightful talk. Yes, I've we got have too deep. <laughs> <laughs> too we much. have two questions. Yeah, good, good. Okay, the first one is about reincarnation. Mm. If there is no self, mm. what is going to reincarnate? Ah, that's a good question. Yes, and that's that's what the Buddha was teaching when I talked about the middle way. That's what he was actually basically teaching that with with a um, cause and effect, you don't need a soul or a, a, a me that's running the show. It's not, or a, or a self or a, a spirit. It is a process that's happening. That's what the Buddha is saying. And in actual fact, if it weren't a process, you couldn't do much about it. It would be permanent, it would be fixed. But what could be fixed in a world where everything is change, you know? I think most people can see change in, in the, the world but they may not apply it to themselves, to their 
uh, to their minds anyway. But so what what gets reborn is uh, causes and conditions get reborn. It's cause and effect, giving rise to a, a next cause and effect, and so on. And that gives rise to you know our actions by body, speech, and mind. That it creates our karma. And that karma takes us to a, a new life. So it's not a it's not um, a self. It's not a soul. It's not a spirit. It's it is a process. You know that's doing that of cause and effect. I hope that uh, makes some sense. It's it's um, yeah. Some ways of looking at it is you know for instance we what we take to be ourselves is really the things that we've become uh, habituated to, things we've liked, we've repeated. When we talk about self, we often talk about the things we like, you know, and uh, we, we, all those things. So, so this sense of self is something we've built up, not only from what our likes and dislikes, but all the conditioning in our lives, you know, the influences of others, our parents particularly, society, the time we live in. You know, we live in a time when you know, the, the ideas are so different from a hundred years ago. So now we see a lot of these, uh, um, you know, um, uh, there's, there's quite a move to get rid of some of the statues of people who are hundred or two hundred years ago were doing, were doing things that were okay then, but now we think, wow, that's terrible. So, that's, uh, so we, we are products of the time we live in, actually. So there are many things that influence us, but it's not a self, not a permanent me. As I said, it works in progress. And the point is, to, as we works in progress, is to develop positive things, wholesome things. And that is, that's the, especially in the mind. So, I hope that answers that question from, where was that from, Joanne? Um, four seconds, please. Just wondered. It's always interesting. Can't see. Can't tell. Um, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce no. the name. <laughs> um, Hugh Yi K. Oh. Yeah. I don't know if that country. I don't know that country. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm not too good at pronouncing. No, no, that's all right. No, no. And what's the second one then? What's the, the second one? question? That's a Isn't it when you have a faith on Buddha's wisdom, mm -hmm. we will lead to release dhamma, uh, realize dharma? Otherwise, you think you know all and follow wrong paths. Yes, yes, that's a, that's a, that is, that is, yes, because uh, the the faith, that's true, that faith is an important thing because we won't try anything unless we have faith in it, actually, or confidence in it. If we think something is going to be for our benefit, for our happiness and well-being, we will we'll, we'll put energy into it. But if we don't have faith in something, why try it? We won't, we, that's basically it, you know. So the, the, the point is we do need faith, yes, we do need faith, but we need to investigate what we're taking faith in. And the Buddha um, always encouraged that. In fact, he's, he's probably the only teacher I know of that <laughs> actually said, investigate me, <laughs> whether I'm enlightened. Now that's pretty radical, I think, pretty radical. So it is faith because you have to have that sense that, yeah, this is worth worthwhile. You know, it can, it can actually lead to good outcomes for me, you know, and then to investigate it as you go. So it becomes your own wisdom. Because it's not enough just to have the faith, you know, you've got to develop your own direct experience uh, of, the, of, of life and, and see reality uh, for yourself. The Buddha, Buddha's wisdom is his wisdom, <laughs> so we have to make it ours. So thank you very much for that, and now I think that's it. So very good, and now we can, uh, for those who would like to, we can um, bow to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha to finish off. All right. <laughs>